This episode is brought to you by Circle, the issuer of USDC, one of the most trusted stable coins in the digital asset industry. You'll be hearing all about them later in the show. We have a really intense contraction in monetary policy. It's leading to an unbelievable spike in interest rates across the whole economy. That we should be expecting a very, very sharp contraction in economic activity going forward. My worry is that they're tightening so extreme that once this uh, tightening filters through to the rest of the economy, they're going to be forced to ease policy uh, before the inflation rate fully comes down. I, I got to give you credit, man. I was, I was saying before we got on, I think the episode that we did back in April was maybe the most alpha that interview that I've given on, on, that you really gave on on the margin ever. But man, you were really right about a lot of stuff. So yeah, congratulations no, you, on uh, that. You made me look good. It was, uh, it was definitely the, the most comments I've received on a podcast. It was very you know systematic. So hopefully we can sort of touch up some of the things that we addressed then. Yes. So what I want to talk about, so first of all, listeners, you should definitely go back and, and listen to that. But basically what we talked about was the four stages of an economic deceleration. So what I'm going to do here is basically just summarize kind of the TLDR of what those four stages are. And then Eric, I'm going to, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, so you can take over. And, and I'd love to just get your thoughts on where you think we are in that deceleration. So stage one of the deceleration is basically you get a compression of interest rates, right? You get, um, or the rate, there is a rate of change in deceleration on, on a monetary basis, right? So contracting or tightening in the money supply, that leads to interest rates, right? And kind of these forward-looking economic indicators. So like ISM new order, that type of thing. Then that leads to a contraction in corporate profits, right? Mm -hmm. Which is earnings, which is what we're just starting to see, I think right now. Yeah. And finally, that contraction in corporate profits leads to more unemployment, right? So it's kind of neatly stages one, two, three, four, I'm going to turn it over to you. What did I, did I do a good job of summarizing your, your viewpoint? Exactly. Where do you think we are in that cycle? Yeah, you got it exactly right. And I'm just going to use a couple of charts to, to hopefully help articulate the point. Can you, can you see where we are here? Yep. Yes, I can. Okay. So this is, this is what we call a coincident index. And before we get into all of the leading parts of the cycle, the, the coincident indicator, which is what's shown here, is what defines the trend. So when people say, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? What they're talking about is coincident indicators. And coincident indicators are comprised of what I call the four corners of the economy. So we have income, production, consumption, and employment. Every economy has those four corners, and they, and they work together in a cyclical fashion, which is why the economy moves in cycles. I think if you have more income, that leads to more consumption. If you have more consumption, then they need to produce more. If there is more production, then you need more employment. More employment filters back through to more income. And then you have a virtuous cycle that, that moves upward. You can also have a vicious cycle where uh, you, know, you have lower income, lower consumption, less need for production, less need for employment that filters through to even lower income. So you kind of see how those four corners uh, work together. So what this coincident indicator is showing us is we obviously had a crazy crash, which I cut off in the access in terms of growth. Then we had an unbelievable rise in growth to the 8% level. And this is real growth. And then growth has normalized back to the long-term trend really quickly. So here we are, we're now back at the long-term trend of 1.9, 1.8% trending growth. So the question is, are we going to continue decelerating, go below trend and ultimately go below zero? Or have we sort of had this huge rise in growth? We normalized back the trend and now we're going to hang out here and we're going to go you know, business as usual. So in order to make that determination, that's when we go through our, our you know, sequential steps that you did a very good job of outlining. Mm. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start from the beginning of the sequence, um, mm. which is um, you know, contraction in monetary policy, right? So we have monetary policy that sets the stage and we can see that we're having basically the, the sharpest contraction in monetary policy ever, ever meaning basically back to the 1980s. Uh, mm. You could use any monetary aggregate you use. Everyone has an opinion on what's the best monetary aggregate. It really doesn't matter. They're all showing the same message, which is monetary policy is contracting at the fastest rate in 40 or 50 years. Um, what has that led to? 
the, the most vicious contraction in monetary policy has led to the sharpest rise in interest rates across the whole economy. And this is all developing the last time we talked as well. It's just gotten even more extreme now. This mm -hmm. chart shows a composite of mortgage, corporate, and treasury rates. So it impacts everybody. And it's graphed inversely on an 18-month basis. So this last point here on the chart, 378, what does that mean? It means that interest rates across the economy are 378 basis points higher than they were 18 months ago, which is obviously an extraordinary level of tightening, again, most extreme since the 1980s. We haven't had to deal with a 300 basis point interest rate spike since 1981 at a time when debt to GDP was 200% lower. So there is a unbelievable amount of tightening that is still going to be filtering through the economy. Um, mm -hmm. You can see that you know in the last couple of recessions, it took, you know, 150 to 200 basis points of tightening to really trigger a recession. Now we're, we're, we're closing it on 400. And the point with this chart is this is a longer leading indicator. You can see a lot of space between where this troughs and where the recession begins. So that's sort of the, the difficulty that we're having with this cycle is the Fed keeps pushing rates higher and higher and higher and higher. And they keep waiting for every CPI print to say, did it show up yet? Did it show up yet? <laughs> and the interest rate hike today will have absolutely no bearing on the inflation print tomorrow, which is you know part of the problem. So just recapping, we have a really intense contraction of monetary policy. It's leading to an unbelievable spike in interest rates across the whole economy. Since the economy is cyclical, you know, there's a little bit of a wonky concept, but if you can conceptualize the most lagging indicator, in a way, that's your most leading indicator, right? If everything moves in a perfectly cyclical fashion, what happens last can also technically be considered to happen first, right? So we know that uh, CPI or inflation is really lagging. The most lagging within that is the rent or services component. So what I did here is a graph, an average of rent CPI and services CPI inversely. Right. So what this uh, and intuitively, it makes sense. Right. If you're a consumer and you're absorbing a massive increase in rent, but your income hasn't changed, you're going to have to lower your level of consumption in the future. It's just, you know, basic math. Right. So every time that there's a major spike in rent or services inflation, again, with a longer lead time, you end up getting a contraction in economic activity. And what you can see now is we have just an unbelievable spike in, in rent and services CPI. So when you take our early movers, that first stage of, of, of the cycle, we have a record contraction monetary policy, which is leading to a record contraction in, in, uh, or, or spike in interest rates. We also have a record amount of, of uh, services and rent inflation being pushed on the consumer. So everything from that basket is very consistent in telling us that we should be expecting a very, very sharp contraction in economic activity going forward. The first place where that shows up is the housing market, mm -hmm. almost always, right? Because it's so interest rate sensitive. And what you can see is uh, this is our uh, housing market index. It's a it's a sentiment survey of home building companies, and it's falling at the most precipitous rate since the 2006-2007 period. So there is a very, very pronounced slowdown going on in the housing market. If you look at the demand for mortgages uh, purchases, we fall into basically a decade low. So the transition or, or transmission from monetary policy to housing is fully underway. That mm -hmm. part of the sequence, you can check that off as well. Those two things tend to have a, or, or the, the monetary policy, the change in interest rates, the spike in rent inflation, and then the spillover to the housing market, that tends to have an eight to 12 month lead time over you know, our, our more coincident data that I showed earlier. So in order to get a more timely, like three to six month lead time, we look at the shorter leading indicators, we call them, which is what happens after the housing market slows down? After the housing market slows down, what you tend to see is a decline in manufacturing new orders because what goes into the new construction of a house? Raw materials, you know, industrial commodities, durable goods like refrigerators, ovens, furniture, all of that stuff translates to new orders. 
So what are we seeing? We're seeing new orders contracting, and they've contracted in three of the last four months. That's very consistent with the sequence that we're seeing develop. The other thing that I would note is that the contraction is starting to accelerate here, which is consistent with how sharp uh, the contraction in our earlier leading indicators were. So this is a sign that the slowdown in the economy, you know, in, in the indicators that most people follow, like retail sales and, and employment, this is actually moving into our three to six month window now because the the decline has fully spread from our longest leading categories all the way now through new orders, which are recessionary. If we look at the ratio of new orders to inventory, declining to the lowest level since you know the COVID crash, really, um, that signals that production is going to have to slow in the future because there's an imbalance between the new orders that customer, uh, manufacturers are receiving and the level of inventories that are starting to rise. Um, you know, uh, supplier delivery times. This is another, you know, indicator in that shorter leading bucket that tells us that, you know, look, manufacturers were really delayed on, on, on delivering uh, products because of supply chains, but also because they were so uh, backlogged with so much, uh, you know, extra, mm. extra orders that is starting to fade. It's not contractionary yet, but it's heading there. Um, so this, again, is more evidence that in this three to six month window going forward is when you know really recessionary conditions are gonna hit. Industrial commodities is another one of those shorter leading indicators that gives us a more timely read. So housing market has slowed. Now you have less demand for these industrial commodities. Industrial commodities like copper and rubber and you know, cement, all of these things declining at a 22% annualized rate. Um, the only indicators that haven't fallen to a point where we should be expecting a recession in the next three months are the uh, employment indicators. Initial claims, they've ticked up since April. They kind of started to tick back down. Um, so I'll, I'll pause here and, and basically say that where we're at is we had a very extreme contraction in monetary policy. That spread through to changes in interest rates. That has mm -hmm. already spread through to housing. Now it's spreading through to manufacturing new orders. All parts of that sequence are underway and basically, and they're gonna continue. Now what that means is over the next three to six months, you're going to see that level of contraction or that level of deceleration finally hit home in the indicators that matter, which are consumption, income, uh, production, and employment employment being you know the last of those four to move so that was a lot, that was a lot but that's sort of a recap of, of where we're at yeah now i actually want to zoom in on your your indicator for credit right there were three components that right there's mortgage rate mm -hmm. uh basically treasuries i would assume right and then there was uh sorry what was the third but it was the, the three corporate. groups right I'm, corporate. yeah I got it corporate i'm assuming the reason there is because there are three groups of borrowers right there are consumers corporates and stocks, exactly exactly right? so so basically, your indicators are good encapsulation of borrowing costs for, for every single group. Exactly. Right? And, the, and the reason that it's a good indicator also is because, you know, when, you know, when people look at like LQD, the, the corporate mm -hmm. bond ETF, and they say it's going down, they're saying, oh, my God, corporate credit is getting wrecked. Well, maybe, maybe not. Right. Because the treasury rate could be rising, but the, the corporate spread may not be widening at all. Mm. And LQD is just declining because of the uh, change in mortgage rates. Mm. The, the chart that I showed would capture changes in treasury rates. It would capture changes in the spread, changes in the spread between mortgages and treasury rates. So it, it captures the, the treasury rate. It captures the spread. So it, it's, a, it's a really good blend of what's happening to borrowers all across the economy. Right. And, right. and as we talked about in our last um our last podcast, you know, I sort of walked through how the sequence works for uh, households and how it ripples through the household uh, you know, housing sector. But when we look at it through the corporate sector, you know, we look at it in, in a different lens ha and how higher interest rates, tighter monetary policy, reduce profit margins. And then the reduction in profit margins leads companies to uh, reduce capital expenditures to try and preserve profits. And when that doesn't work, ultimately reduce headcount. 
Yeah. So you've done a really good job so far. You just started to get into the forward looking stuff. We've got a great summary of, and to your credit, again, you said all of this in, in April when we last talked, but that's the situation as it happens today. The next step that we'd be looking towards is earnings, right? And what we've seen so far, basically the, the reversion that we've seen in the S&P, the, the major stock indices in the US is basically price-based, right? So there are two components that go into its valuation, which is the P, and then under that is the E, which is the earnings. Mm -hmm. So far, basically what we've seen is a change in the discount rate as a function of rising interest rates, right? So the cash flows that we were discounting at a very, very charitable level, right? As interest rates go up, the mm -hmm. rate that we discount those cash flows, we value them a lot less. That's ba that basically explains the reversion that we've seen in the stock market today. Now we've got the earnings, right? And that is just starting to change. So walk us through what we should be expecting based on your model for corporate earnings. Yeah, exactly. That was a perfect summary. And I have I have a chart that may articulate what uh, what you said there. Uh, you can see this. This is a, a relative performance between IWM, which is the Russell 2000 or small caps and TLT, which is the long term treasury bond ETF. Um, and what you'll see in this chart, or if you want to graph it yourself and pull it back further, is that the chart tracks nominal growth very, very well. So we had a mm -hmm. slowdown in 2018 and 2019 before COVID. Remember, the Fed was cutting interest rates before COVID, and IWM was falling against TLT, meaning IWM was underperforming TLT. Then we had the big COVID crash. Then we had this big spike uh, with, with the recovery, and we basically grinded completely sideways, right? That means that IWM and TLT have been performing basically the same. They've both been performing terribly, but basically the same, mm -hmm. right? So that that um, emphasizes your point that the decline in stocks is just because we've had a decline in bonds or the mm -hmm. decline in stocks is just because we've had a rise in interest rates. All we've done is change the discount rate. So stocks and bonds are moving one for one. As we get to the next step, which I believe occurs in the next three to six months, I've been uh, outlining in my research to clients that the, the window that I'm targeting for the sharpest economic declines is, is this October to February window. So as the earnings expectations start to fall apart, what we should see is a widening of credit spreads, which we haven't really seen yet. They've been leaking wider, but, but not that much. So we should see a widening of credit spreads and a decline in earnings. And even if Treasury bonds continue to decline. What we should see is that stocks should start to decline more than treasury bonds because mm -hmm. they should be declining from both vectors. They should be declining because, you know, maybe rates are still going up, but also because earnings are going down or treasury bonds may uh, start may, may stop declining or rise if the Fed pumps the brakes on, on tightening, but that earnings component should still come down. So in my view, the next step of this is we're going to see uh, really sharp reductions in, in corporate earnings expectations. And that's going to bring back, um, in, in, in my view, a, a, a revival of this negative correlation between stocks and bonds, where for the past you know 18 months, we sort of grinded sideways with this positive correlation where they've declined one for one, the next step as it, you know, the next step is really the recessionary step. We should see stocks underperforming bonds like we did here in this 2018, 19, 20 scenario. Um, and, and that could come in a variety of ways. I mean, it could be both declining together with stocks declining more. It could be stocks declining, bonds rising. Uh, but I really think that that's the next step here, which is going to be reflective of a, of a decline in earnings, which is what we haven't seen yet. Mm. And then, the, so when we get the, the compression in corporate earnings, right, the next obvious result of that is going to be what the Fed has continued to point to as the reason for their aggressive monetary policy and all the hikes that they've been doing, which is the unemployment rate, which has stayed persistently low. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I wanted to chart all of that out again, so you can see the economy is a very big thing and it takes, you know, the monetary policy takes an enormous amount of time to to take an effect. It's not like you can raise or lower rates and, and, and you can right. get an effect anywhere in that cycle instantaneously. Unemployment is the very last thing in that mm -hmm. entire cycle. Right. It is also the metric that the Fed is hyper-focused in on right. right now, which 
that's, I just wanted to give the audience a sense of, you know, when you hear the Fed is driving the rear view mirror here, they are doing it to an enormous degree because there are many lagging indicators that we're talking about, but unemployment is the most lagging of all the lagging indicators. So right. it's a little bit scary that they've identified that as what they're paying the most attention to. What do you think? Right. No, exactly. And it's actually even worse than you described. So um, they are targeting the unemployment rate, which is absolutely the last thing to move in the sequence. So by the time the unemployment rate starts to rise, those earlier sectors like the housing market are going to be completely battered in, yeah. in a way that, that doesn't, um, you know, everyone has this belief that as soon as the Fed pivots and eases monetary policy, the housing market's going to snap back and, and, and go, you know, full steam again. That's not true when the economy has a hard landing. If, the, if it's preemptive easing, sure, the housing market can turn around really quickly. But we got to remember from the 07, uh, 08 cycle that the Fed paused interest rate hikes in 06 and they didn't and they started cutting rates in the summer of 07. Housing market, you know, cascaded lower way after that. Now, there are a variety of reasons for that. But the, the point here is that you can reach a point in, in an economic downturn where that vicious cycle starts to spiral, where you have lower income, lower consumption, lower production, and it's moving uh, in, in a downward fashion where interest rate cuts don't immediately get the cycle going back in the other direction. So mm. when, when the cycle starts to move downward, it's not that easy to reverse it. And it's not as easy as we're going to stop hiking rates. A lot of times what it takes to reverse that cycle is we're going to cut interest rates from 400 basis points to zero, right? That would get the cycle going in the other direction. But that's a long way off. So the reason I say it's even worse than that is because they're targeting unemployment, which is lagging, and then they're targeting inflation, specifically CPI or PCE inflation, which is extraordinarily lagging. Mm -hmm. And it's lagging from where it uh, moves in the economic sequence. So employment and inflation are very, very lagging. But core inflation, uh, which is sort of getting everyone's attention now, is very, very influenced by uh, rent or shelter, right? Mm. And rent and shelter are very lagging from where they appear in the economic sequence because they're very correlated to wages, right? And wages mm. are, move very, very late. So it's lagging from where it appears in the economic sequence, but it's also extremely lagging in the way that the uh, consumer price index reports rent inflation. Now, this is a really critical point. The CPI is constructed by very smart people, and they, and, and my honest opinion is they do the best job they can to represent the inflation rate for uh, average person, right? My grandmother has a much different CPI than I do, right? I have a much different CPI than your parents do. So it's a very difficult job for the CPI to capture what's the average for all of us, right? And what they do with rent is... Let's say your rental lease for your apartment comes due uh, this month and rent has declined 1%. You'll experience a decline in your inflation rate, but I won't experience a decline in my inflation rate because my lease isn't up for another six months, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in, in an honest attempt to try and capture inflation for everybody, they make those rental changes leak in slowly over time because you may be experiencing the decline in rent, but I'm not, right? I won't experience the decline in rent until my lease is up six months from now. And then the lion's share of that rent inflation basket will, will show people that have declining um, rents. But when we look at real-time rents from things like Zillow or apartment list, we can see that rents are actually starting to fall now, but they're only falling for the marginal person that's renewing. Mm -hmm. So... The Fed is, is looking at the core CPI, which showed a rental inflation of, you know, whatever it was, plus 0 0.8 in this last report, a super, super hot number, while real-time rents are actually starting to come down. Now, it's not a, it's not a flaw of the CPI. It's, it's constructed that way for a good reason. Uh, I don't think when they constructed the rent CPI index, they were anticipating they were going to conduct monetary policy off of it. They were just doing their, their, their honest best work to try and represent what's rent inflation for the average person, knowing that not everyone's contract renews every single month. So they are flying so blind in tracking the uh, 
uh, core CPI here, one, because it's super lagging just where it appears in the economic sequence, and two, because of the methodology that's used in constructing the CPI. So by the time that that CPI comes down, and it's the most amazing thing, all you have to do is plot rent CPI or services CPI on a long-term chart, you'll see that it peaks in the middle or even at the end of recessions. So the idea here is the Fed could be raising interest rates, not only into the beginning, into the middle of a recession, which creates the possibility for much sharper uh, declines than I think anyone really wants here. And it's a really, really difficult balance that they're trying to, to, to thread here. And I'm not sure that uh, it's going to end well because um, they're just going to be tightening uh, for, for, for a really, really long time beyond, in my view, what, what they need. I, I yeah. think... You know, to, to round out this point without me ranting too much, I'm not suggesting that they should ease monetary policy now. I think they would have been better served to probably go more slowly, but hold the tightening stance longer. My worry is that they're tightening so extreme that once this uh, tightening filters through to the rest of the economy, they're going to be forced to ease policy uh, before the inflation rate fully comes down. Mm. All right, I've got two questions for you in there. One, can we try to quantify the situation with housing? You know, you've expressed that it's a pretty dire situation. I mean, just exactly. I mean, if you're someone out there and you've got a mortgage, uh, you maybe you just bought a house in the last couple of years, like how bad can this thing get, do you think? Yeah, so the way that I look at housing is, um, you know, I'm not, it, it, housing is always a sensitive topic, right? Because someone bought a house and then you're saying that the housing market's going to go down and they, they automatically hate you. I'm not really talking about, you know, if someone bought a house, you know, something bad is going to happen to them. My, my view on housing and how it, you know, filters into the economic cycle is really about the new construction market. And it's about okay. the marginal unit of consumption, the marginal unit of production. So I, I'm not suggesting that rates have gone up and existing homeowners are going to default and their home values. Gonna, because if you bought a house and you can afford your monthly payment, your net worth will decline if the price goes down, but you're not going to be kicked out of your house or anything like that. The problem is in the in the marginal construction. There's going to be um, a significant imbalance between the, the new volume of transactions that goes down for, for new construction and what's built in the pipeline, right? So when you look at the new home sale market, there's a really high level of month supply. It's in the mm -hmm. 8 to 10 range. A balanced market is like five. But the existing home sale market has a month supply of about three. Super, super tight. Because if you have a low mortgage rate, you're never going to want to sell that, right? You're never going to list your house. But if you're a home building company with new supply coming online, nobody owns that house yet. you got to sell it to somebody new at that 7% rate. And nobody's buying that. So what's going to happen here, in my view, when I'm talking about the housing market, is you're going to see a dramatic reduction in the volume of new construction. Home builders are going to say, you know, we got a lot of inventory in the pipeline that we're not moving at favorable prices. We got to slow down our rate of new construction. That's going to ultimately reset the prices on, on the more aggregate housing market. But really what it's going to do is it's going to perpetuate that negative cycle of Less construction means we need to order less materials, which means new orders in the manufacturing sector are going to go down further, which means that we need less employees to build mm. new houses, uh, which means lower income. So it's really about how the new construction market feeds through to that uh, vicious economic cycle more than it's about, you know, you bought a house for a million. It's going to sell for, you know, 850 now. Uh, your net worth declined 150 grand, it may not mean anything to you. And I'm not suggesting that it does. What I'm really suggesting is that the new construction market, the volume of, of just construction generally, whether it's residential construction, commercial construction, is going to really dramatically slow. That's going to impact employment, manufacturing. It just ripples through the whole economy. And that's what's really going to happen over the next several months. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest surprises to me, and I know maybe you share this view too, we were talking about it before we got on here, uh, is the fact that we've been able to, the Fed has been able to hike thus far without breaking anything domestically, right? I'm recording this, I'm actually in London right now, right? So something broke over here. Uh, but, broke, yeah. yeah, but but, you know, 
there was kind of that rate. It was between two and a half and three percent in 2018 when Powell originally tried to hike. That's when we got the pivot. There's a lot of explanations. Really smart people. I followed Diego Perea. He kind of put something out about a year ago. You know, maybe two and a half percent, something like that. That's what the economy can sustain. And we have this enormous pile of debt, right? Our, our interest payments, I'm assuming, is going off off the charts. Right? It's going to be over a trillion dollars or something this year. So, has it surprised you that we haven't? It hasn't broken anything that we've been able yeah. to hike to the degree yeah, that we have. And, and I'm, I was in a similar camp as, as, as Diego, which you mentioned, um, in, in assessing where the, the, the neutral rate in the economy is. I think there are two things, which, by the way, I didn't have a great um, forecast on, on this either. You know, this has been a really difficult time for, for anybody to have a good um, uh, you know, playbook for exactly how this is going to fold out. And I've been equally as surprised in the lack of um, really extreme credit events given how high the terminal rate has gone. And I think that's for two reasons. One is because this time, as opposed to 2018, we're working off a situation of extreme excess liquidity, right? So even though the rate has gone up so much, there's been so much liquidity in the system that's really cushioned um, any extreme events that could be take, that could take place, right? So I think that on a very surface level, um, the, the mountain of liquidity that's been out there has alleviated some of the really extreme credit events that, that may have otherwise happened. Now, every day that goes by, that liquidity pile gets smaller, which increases the probability that an event like that happens. The second thing is that, you know, we were talking in, in, the, in the pre-call, is that the speed at which this has happened is, is much different. And as we mm. walk through that economic cycle, that sequence, you can see how from the time that interest rates move up to it filters through the housing market, to it filters through new orders until it eventually gets to employment, that could be 12 to 15 months. And then it could be another six months after that for it to impact inflation. So we're talking about you know something like a 12 month lead time ahead of changes in employment, maybe an 18 month lead time ahead of changes in inflation. They only started hiking rates in March of this year. So we really only had you know, six or seven months of this interest rate effect. So those early rate hikes um, in, in, you know, the spring, summer of 22 haven't even hit the economy yet. And, and what that's done is because the Fed has moved so fast, uh, going 75 bips at a clip, is it's allowed them to get the rate to a way higher level than anyone anticipated because normally they would go 25 or 50 at a clip. Which means okay. by now we'd only be at you know two percent, something like that, and the economy, in my view, would still fall into a recession, and we'd still have that same slowdown had they only gone at their normal pace and arrived at two two and a half percent here. The problem is they moved so late and they tried to make up for lost time by going more quickly and it doesn't work that way. they can't effectuate the change in inflation quicker because they're moving faster, right? <laughs> all that's going to happen is that when those interest rate hikes eventually make their way all the way through the economy, which again, in my view, is the next three to six months, that flush is going to be way more extreme than it otherwise would have been had they gone at their at their normal pace. So I think that the reason that it's, um, you know, we, 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 we have a lack of a credit event is one, because the tightening hasn't filtered all the way through yet to earnings, to employment, and two, because we're working off this mountain of excess liquidity. Both of those things are, are really coming to an end here in the next three to six months. Um, so I think that the probability that something does happen here is is probably pretty high. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are two ways, I think, right, that the Fed stops uh, hiking, right? The, which is one, um, they achieve their goals, right? Uh, we see, you know, CPI, in, you know, moderate back down to who knows. They've I haven't come out and said this. It's probably not going back to the two percent level. Maybe it's three or four. Whatever they decide is the new correct level. Goes down to their right level. Unemployment moderates to maybe four point five percent, which has been the historical average. Basically, their policy works. That's way number one. Way number two is something breaks, right? Those are basically the two. And something like Janet Yellen, we're recording this on the fourteenth, came out I think yesterday or two days ago and said they're basically cracks forming in the treasury market. We know back in 2020, when the Fed did their big intervention and restarted QE infinity, they didn't say, oh, we're concerned that the S&P is down however many points. They were really concerned about malfunctioning in the treasury market. So I guess if you, would, if you had to handicap it, I mean, which, which, way do you, which one do you think happens first? The Fed achieves their goals 
or something breaks? Yeah, so I think that there's going to be a credit event. Credit meaning, you know, corporate credit, uh, treasury, um, you know, some some fixed income. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a credit event before uh, inflation returns back to 2%, right? Mm -hmm. or, or in the vicinity of 2%. Depending on how hard they can smash oil prices down, they may be able to get headline CPI uh, down into the 3% range or 2% range uh, in Q1 of 23, simply because of the comparisons against the Russia-Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we do, in fact, go into a recession here in Q4, Q1, and you know, making it up, let's say oil goes to, you know, $60 a barrel or $55 a barrel in a recessionary event, you're going to be comparing, you know, that March, April invasion uh, of $120 oil, right? So you're going to have like mm -hmm. a negative 40, negative 50% year on year uh, change in oil prices. That right. could drag headline CPI significantly down. You're also going to have like negative 15, 20 percent year on year change in used cars, uh, which is going to drag uh, the durable goods component down. So on a headline basis, I think that by Q1, they could have inflation in the vicinity of where they want it to be on a headline basis. Core inflation won't be near their two percent target until at least the middle of 23 because of that lags in, in the rent that we talked about. So. I think it's going to be really hard for them to declare mission accomplished in any capacity before Q1 23, you know, maybe maybe more closer towards the, the spring of 23. Um, the chances that we get a credit event before then, I think, are quite high. Now, the, the, the real test for the Fed is, are they able to um, address the credit event in a micro fashion um, that continues functioning of markets without uh, broad liquidity injections, right? So are they able to, you know, maybe tweak bank regulations to give more dealer balance sheet capacity? Are they able to, uh, you know, instruct uh, insolvent situations to go to the discount window rather than solve it with broad injections of liquidity? So if they're able to handle some of these events on a more surgical basis, they may be able to extend or, or prolong the need to ease policy really aggressively. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the problems of the last 10 years is that every hiccup was addressed with a flood of liquidity. And ultimately it worked, but they don't know really why it worked. It was just like a fire hose, right? And that was sort of the COVID situation. They have a lot of time. They've sort of been monitoring the situation for a while. They know something eventually is going to happen. They don't know what. But if a credit event pops up in the private credit markets, let's say, perhaps they don't have to react to that because it's a private mm -hmm. credit market event. And, you know, that will actually help them achieve their goal as, as painful as it may be. If the if the event happens in the Treasury market, you know, they, they, they should try and address these issues as surgically and, um, you know, microscopically as they can, while allowing the, the rest of the system to 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 correct as, as much as possible. Now, it is a very difficult task. Uh, I think it depends on the nature of how it unfolds. Does it, does it unfold in a way that needs like immediate attention? Does it happen slowly over time? It's really hard to say how these events play out, but I think there's a, a path here where they can address some of these cracks uh, more surgically, um, and they should be as reluctant as possible to address them with broad liquidity. Um, that, mm -hmm. will, that will, um, prevent them from achieving their goal, I think. So yeah. to answer your question, I think a credit event happens first. The, the, the real test is going to be how do they answer that first credit event? Yeah. Is it answered with broad liquidity or is it not? And if it's not, man, that would be a surprise to everybody. I speak to a lot of companies in both crypto and traditional finance. And as it turns out, they share a common problem. They need a one-stop shop for treasury management and fast international payments around the globe. Circles USDC is one of the most trusted and widely used stable coins in the industry. At the time of this recording, USDC has 50 billion in circulation, one and a half million users worldwide, and is settling more than $5 trillion. That's trillion with a T worth of value. USDC has quickly become one of the easiest ways to move your money around the globe. On top of all that, 
Circle is building products for companies and institutions that want to adopt this technology. That means payment transactions, fraud management tools, digital asset custody, and a whole other suite of services. Here's one of my other favorite parts about Circle. They post monthly audits of their reserves, which means that I don't have to trust. I can verify that my money is safe, transparent, in a compliant manner. Helps me sleep easy at night, you know? As a seamless trusted digital dollar, USDC is a zero to one opportunity for the entire global financial system. And you know what? Don't trust me, you can verify. Check out their recently published Transparency Hub on the website. It's a great update to Circle's content in USDC, outlines everything from USDC weekly reserve reports, monthly attestations, and blog posts written by their exec team. Just go to circle.com backslash transparency to access it. Now, back to the show. So I want to try this because everything that we've been talking about thus far is your cyclical view, right? This is what happens over the, uh, I don't know what the average six time cycle of this. Six to six 12. 12 months. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's a, a longer term secular view. So if I had to sum up the, the cyclical part of things, right? Very bearish on the housing market. We think we're going to see a big reversion or, or uh, you know, trend lower in corporate earnings. And that's eventually going to lead to unemployment. The question there being, uh, how does the Fed react to all of this? And does something break before... Uh, you know, they, they see what they want to basically right. from an inflation or not. But all that's going to basically, the, the timeline on that is Q1, latest kind of Q2 of this coming year. Um, walk me through, you know, that's your sort of cyclical view on things. When Walk me through, you've got a secular view on things as well. What does that mean, the secular versus the cyclical? What's your view on the secular side of things? Yeah, so secular is the really long-term, slow-moving uh, trends in the economy things that impact growth, impact inflation. And the two most dominant factors on the secular basis are productivity and population, or, hmm. or simply debt and demographics, right? From, from a very, very high level, higher levels of both public and private sector debt are reducing productivity, they're reducing economic growth. Um, it's, it's, and it's also a factor that's reducing on, on a secular basis has reduced the level of inflation for the last 30, 40 years. After COVID, the economy became more indebted than it was before COVID. So on an on a, on a, on a analysis of just US debt or global debt, the situation has gotten more extreme. So on that basis, we should expect lower growth uh, and, and lower inflation on the secular view. Uh, demographically, it's the same situation where Slower levels of population growth aren't helpful for broad economic growth. Certainly negative levels of population like Japan and Europe are experiencing are very, very uh, serious situations. And then aging demographics tends to weigh on economic growth as well. So whenever you have a cocktail of higher levels of debt, slower levels of population growth and aging population, that is a very, very, very clear cut uh, slower growth forever forecast. So that's sort of the, the secular view from a pure economic standpoint. Now, the conversation always has to move into, well, what do we do about it? Everyone, whether you're on the inflation camp or the deflation camp, generally agrees with what I just outlined in that slower population growth, older demographics, and higher debt levels all contribute to negative or weaker economic growth. Where the fork in the road happens, in my view, between the inflation and deflation camp is what's the response to that very slow growth. Now, if the response uh, to the next recession, which I think happens, as I mentioned, you know, probably in the next couple of quarters here, if the response is um, a COVID-like stimulus situation where we you know, put four or five, six trillion dollars directly into the economy, I do think that that would be inflationary again in the same way that it was for the last two years. Um, but to the extent that they don't repeat a really broad-based pandemic-like response, I think that the secular trends are going to reassert themselves in the sense that inflation is going to come down as the economy goes into a recession, and in my view, potentially deep recession. Um, there are other, you know, secular trends that that we could kick around, but from a very high level, that's that's kind of where I fall on it. I know we can, you know, maybe address energy situations and things like that, but I'll uh, yeah get back to you. Well, well, the one the one for me, and I, I want to be very cognizant and call it a place that I was wrong. I used to have these debates with Tyler, was the co-host of On the Margin before Mark came on. We used to have these debates about secular inflation versus deflation. I was very much in the deflation camp at that point, and my the thing that I was always very uh, focused on was 
labor pools, right? And basically one of the huge deflationary, uh, you know, tailwinds that we've had in the U.S. is basically being able to borrow from low cost labor pools specifically and, mm-hmm. you know, China being the primary source there. I think one of the things that has been an eye opener for me is first of all, to just watch the wage increases myself on the ground, but two, this kind of geopolitical fracture in between, you know, these sign there's kind of our shift from a, you know, a unipolar to a multipolar kind of world. I know that's pretty buzzwordy, but it, real talk, I mean, you as a, as a CEO have got to be second questioning outsourcing, right? Mm-hmm. If, uh, hey, there's a, you have, maybe you can discount it, but it's like a 20% chance that if I set up a supply chain that's based out of China, then the government's going to tap my shoulder and 16 months and say, hey, you can't do that anymore because of national interest X, Y, and Z. Right. And the inability to borrow from that lower cost, that's that's a tough one to, to get around. So I don't, I'm going to say I don't have strong conviction here, but that's where uh, I think yeah. that, that's a... No, I, I know where you're going with that. And one thing that's interesting, is there's been a lot of talk of deglobalization, but when we look at the numbers, the trade deficit is wider than ever, yeah. right? And yeah. it, it, it keeps widening, right? So maybe maybe we move out of China yeah. and we move to Vietnam. Um, what I would say about uh, inflation is the same way that we walk through the sequence of economic events on the growth side, we can do the same thing on inflation. Inflation is really misunderstood and it's incorrectly described in every textbook as a wage price spiral. I'm sure you've heard everyone talk about a wage price spiral. It's not the way that the sequence actually works out. You're an employer, right? No one, uh, no employer goes to their employees and gives them a preemptive wage raise because they think inflation is going to come six months from now, right? That would be a wage price spiral, right? Yeah. You go to your employees and say, hey, I'm going to give you guys all a 10% wage because I think inflation's coming, right? The, the way it works is a money price wage spiral. So there's a monetary acceleration. Think about what happened. There was a monetary acceleration in 2020, 2021. Prices rise. And then employer employees go to their employers and say, hey, look, price is really going up here. Uh, I'm demanding a wage increase. Mm-hmm. And then you grant them the wage increase. So it's a money, price, wage spiral. Now, when you think about it in reverse, right, money, price, wage, there's a monetary deceleration. Is that underway? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Prices then fall. What are we seeing everywhere, Right. Home prices are starting to come down. Asset prices are coming down. Used car prices are coming down. Freight rates are coming down. Container rates are coming down. Commodity prices are coming down. Money, price. Then getting to that last part of the sequence, employment starts to suffer and wages will start to decline, right? However, now this is the this is the this is where we can, you know, go into secular inflation, is we have these three kind of things moving in simultaneously money price wage money is down prices are starting to come down not you know not every price but it's starting Mm -hmm. and wages are still really high right Mm -hmm. if the fed holds this stance money will keep coming down prices will keep coming down and then wages will come down the problem and what happened in the 70s is money down prices down wages up credit event happens we re-stimulate money while wages are still up right then you get money price wage going in the other direction from an elevated base yeah that's the secular inflation camp so if we end up let's say q4 uh or christmas time we have another christmas massacre like 2018 wage inflation is still five six percent and the fed re-stimulates money now we got a big problem because now we're going to get money price wage going in the other direction from a five percent base. Mm. Well, you know what has to happen then in between, right? Let's say we don't get that wages go down. Wages don't go down by you saying, "Hey, uh, it's a tough time. There's a lot of inflation. I'm going to pay you twenty percent less." They go down because people get fired and rehired exactly. at yeah. firms for less. Exactly. You can't pay someone less. You exactly. know, so uh, totally, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah so I, two I, good I, options I, that we have there. Yeah, right? <laughs> two good options. Uh, yeah. So- I would say that that's my view on how like the, the labor situation plays out. And the other point I want to address, because I know I can already see in the comments, people are going to be talking about, you know, the, the, the good heart theory of, of shrinking labor pools is, is inflationary. I'm glad um, you brought this up. And, and I'll be the first to concede that, yes, that is a inflationary dynamic, right? Less labor 
anytime you have like a, you know, a supply demand curve, if you shift the supply curve inward, you get higher prices. Totally on board with that. But inflation, as I just described, is a money price wage spiral. And it is, uh, you can't really judge inflation based on one factor. You have to take a macroeconomic view of the inflationary situation. So that is a singular inflationary element to what could happen going forward because of the shrinking labor pool. But we have to balance that with the demand side, which is lower levels, or less people means less units of consumption, right? You think about if we're selling 10 cars a year, if you have less people, you're definitely not going to sell 10 cars a year, right? Then if you have older demographics, that also results in less unit volume of consumption. We got to think in real terms, we got to think in units because units is what moves the economy. Units is what goes on a truck, which requires a driver, which requires labor, which requires the whole system to start moving. Mm. As the unit volume of consumption falls, which it will, that exposes excess capacity in the economy. So if you sold 10 cars and they needed to be transported with 10 trucks, and now you're selling seven cars, but you still have 10 trucks, what do you do with the excess trucks? What do you do with the excess factory capacity? If the whole world starts to consume a lower level of unit volume and global capacity utilization is at 85% now, and then it moves to 80 and then it moves to 75, what do you do with all the excess factory capacity? And then the question which you're dealing with in China is, okay, do we make additional investments in more factory or more houses or um, you know, more structures if we have less demand. So now you have a lower level of investment that's compounding a situation of excess capacity. So it's a very dynamic situation and we can't just say less labor, higher wages. That's only one factor to it. Uh, I think that it's a, a more complex situation and we have to think about how lower levels of unit volume um, factor through to, to, to the broader economy. And, you know, that's the debate between real and nominal growth. And, and we're undoubtedly going to have a continuous decline in real growth, a continuous decline in the rate of unit volume. Eric, my friend, uh, you've been super generous with your time. Yeah. Every time we talk, I feel like I learn a lot. But we'll have to do another one in the next yeah, uh, always. four months. Yeah, yeah. I love doing the podcast with you. If you keep being this right, man, people are going to start calling you Oracle Besmation. Uh, yeah, Besmation from Delphi or whatever. I good calls. I, I, I definitely have some people that want to throw tomatoes at me. So um, you, know, you, you do the best you can. It's It's been a very difficult time, no matter you know how experienced you are, no matter how you cut it. This situation has, has humbled everybody. And if it hasn't, then I'd like to talk to who you are because this has been a, a tough year for sure. I agree. Eric, if people want uh, more insights into that noggin of yours, how can they follow the good work that you're putting out? Yeah, thank you. Um, you can just check me out on Twitter at EPB Research or um, just go to the link in my Twitter bio, which will bring you to my website. I have some, some premium research that I um, uh, distribute to clients. A lot of my research these days is moving to video content. So you'll get video content, written content. Um, and you can also find me on YouTube. So just search EPB Macro Research on YouTube. Awesome. Eric, as always, my friend, it's been a pleasure. Want to do it again soon. Thanks, Mike. Cheers.